Kelsey. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Cook County Higher Education and Kelsey, so I'm very thankful that they asked me to do this. And uh, I'm a former board member of uh, Cook County Higher Ed, and it's a great program. So I recommend everybody support it. Uh, what I'm going to do is, um, well, first of all, this is an impossible task. Um, uh, the history and the stories around Sawbill, um, I could go for an hour and a half just on the stories surrounding a, a couple of people that are already uh, uh, joined, have already joined us here. But uh, so I'm, what I thought I would do is I have about 40 pictures. They're sort of random <laughs> pictures. Again, impossible task to sort through 62, 64 years of pictures and try to come up with a cogent set. So these are kind of things to remind me. And just, but basically I'm just going to tell a thumbnail history of Sawbill uh, for a while and then uh, try to stay off of the, the uh, involved stories. And then I'll open it up to questions and, and maybe we can get into the more interesting stories at that point or the more uh, colorful stories as it were. So, so I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, get my mug off the screen here and share the, uh, share the photos here. Oops. There we go. So hopefully everybody can see that. It says it's the Sawbill Outfitters brochure. And I uh, thought it'd make a good opening for the uh, presentation. There's kind of a lot going on with this, with this picture. Um, the background that you see, sort of the textured fabric you see in the background is a Duluth pack from the 1940s that belonged to Sawbill Lodge. It's fabric from a Duluth, one of the original Duluth packs from Duluth Tent Nodding in Duluth. And uh, you can see it's faded from its army green to sort of a tan color. Still have that pack, should be in a museum somewhere. But uh, so that's the background. The logo, Sawbill Canoe Outfitters, um, just a quick story behind that. When, when my parents started the Outfitters in 1950, well, 1956, they were getting ready to start it. Uh, they went to get a brochure printed, and the uh, the printer said, uh, uh, "What's your logo?" And they said, "Logo? What's a logo?" And they said, "Well, you have to have some kind of a logo for the face of the brochure." So my dad was teaching at University of Minnesota in Duluth, and he ran down the hall to the art department where a, a drinking buddy of his worked, and ran in and said, "I need a logo in 15 minutes for Sawbill Canoe Outfitters," and. Uh, the guy said, well, what, what is, what's it going to do, you know? And he said, well, it'll be a, a Outfitters for the Boundary Waters. And so he said, what's Sawbill? And my dad said, I think it's a duck. And so in less than 15 minutes, uh, this gentleman dashed off this logo. It's a bit like the Nike uh, origin story. He drew these two ducks, which to a lot of people look like manta rays, and uh, <laughs> which is what I thought they were for the first 10 years of my life. And they also look a lot like geese. Um, but in any case, they're supposed to represent the sawbill duck, but they've, it's become kind of an icon over the years. And, and it's kind of a funny story. Um, he drew the font uh, pretty much freehand. Um, the S was slightly different and it was hard to read. Uh, people often call this gawbill. So we changed that at some point along the line. The picture is from uh, Cherokee Lake. A lot of people think they recognize the campsite and maybe you do, but it's on, um, it's on Cherokee taken by R. Hamilton Smith, the famous National Geographic photographer. And, um, and then the, the uh, tagline, Welcome to Wilderness. And I, I think it's important to focus on that because for all the, the success that Sawbill Outfitters has had over, over the last decades, uh, really the, uh, the star is the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. And that's, that's, where, that's the, the reason for all our success. And, is in fact one of the great treasures of the world. And, and uh, so I just want to make sure that we uh, acknowledge that that's a, that's a huge part of, uh, of Sawbill is the, uh, uh oh, how do I, how do I scroll here? Trouble. Um, Going to have to figure that out. Um, so, oh, here we go. So um, uh, this is a, obviously a, picture of Northern Minnesota. And, and, and uh, I hope you all can see the arrow. The sawbill is right here. And the reason I put up this slide again is just to emphasize the wilderness and the size of the wilderness. Uh, you can see some of the fires, recent fires, Ham Lake and Pagami Creek here. But the fact that we have this giant wilderness area, a million acres in Minnesota, whoops, didn't want to do that. 
uh, million acres in Minnesota and, and um, um, geez, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with the scrolling here. Um, million acres in Minnesota and um, a, nearly a million acres in Canada contiguous is a miracle as far as I'm concerned. And I consider the Wilderness Act one of the great uh, legislative acts of, of the history of the world, uh, right up there with the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act and, um, and the founding uh, principles of the Constitution. Um, so just a great pleasure to be involved in that. And then the next picture is, uh, which we've had a preview of already, is a pictograph. And this is up on Fish Dance Lake. Many of you will recognize it, kind of an enigmatic um, uh, symbol on the rock there. Um, and this was to remind me that to keep in mind and for you to keep in mind that this land really uh, belongs to the original people and that they have just, as European immigrants, um, we have, you know, even though I think of my parents as pioneers, uh, really they were, they were very latecomers to the game up here and that the original people are really the ones that, that ceded use of the land to us uh, some rights to the land and kept some rights for their own. And I think we need to keep that foremost in our mind. A number of years ago, um, the Forest Service, well intentionally, I think, put up a poster on the, at the landing at Sawbill that was titled, Those Who Traveled Here Before. And it had a picture, kind of a stylized picture of a Native American. And it went on to say, you know, this area has been inhabited for nearly 10,000 years by people. You may stumble across artifacts while you're out there if you do if, when you're in the wilderness, leave, leave them in place because people have passed here before you. And uh, one fall, late in the fall, a little pouch of tobacco uh, was nailed to the poster and then uh, some Ojibwe words were written underneath. I copied them down and went up and looked them up on the Ojibwe translator and it said, we are still here. <laughs> and uh, so I think it's, uh, it's important to keep that in mind. Um, as, boy, I sure wish I knew how to scroll this. Um, sorry, hopefully I'll get the hang of that as we go. The scroll button's there and then it disappears, but okay. So Sawbill Canoe Outfitters, um, it, the Sawbill itself, uh, of course, has been there for a long time. The, the or origin of the name is, is uh, lost to history. The Sawbill duck is, in is indeed a, a, a common name for the, uh, or a popular name for the common merganser. Um, which probably almost everybody's familiar with if you've been up here, the crested fish eating duck that has a serrated bill. I have no idea what the name was before that. I'm sure it had a name before that. Um, many of the lakes up here, if they don't retain their, their Native American names, they're Englishized names that sound like something. And I've seen that even in my lifetime. Um, there was a lake, there's a lake over by Brule called Omega Lake and um, in the Boundary Waters. And it, and when I was a kid, and for the first 20 years that we were around here, it was Ogama Lake, and Ogama means beaver in Ojibwa. I might be mispronouncing it, but um, but so many people saw it with the G and the M just transposed that almost everybody, their I would read it as Omega, and they called it Omega, and eventually it changed on the maps, and now it's Omega. So maybe Sawbill came from that. Maybe it sounded like something that sounded like Sawbill, or or maybe it was uh, Shingabus, which is the Ojibwa name for the sawbill duck, for the merganser, who knows. But anyway, um, sawbill um, first saw uh, human beings right after the uh, glaciers receded. And we know that because on Alton Lake, the lake next door to sawbill, there's a very natural campsite in the north end. And Forest Service archaeologists a number of years ago, uh, well, for many years, they they've collected artifacts from Sawbill and from Alton and, and all the lakes in the Boundary Waters that are very ancient, going back to the Paleo people long before the Ojibwe people. And, but on Alton, they found on this campsite, uh, they excavated an ancient fire ring and they were able to carbon date the uh, charcoal from the ring and it came in somewhere between eight and 10,000 years old. So people have been camping and in, on Sawbill for eight to 10,000 years that that we know of. And that indeed is just a very short time after the glaciers receded. In fact, the, the archaeologists were able to tell the, um, the uh, glaciologists when the glaciers receded because their dating was much more accurate than the geological dating. So then uh, the sawbill opened up a little bit in the 20s when the Forest Service built a cabin there. I have a picture of it later. 
And then, uh, but it was, there was no road. So it just was a trail. And then also in the twenties, a railroad was built east to west across the forest. Uh, I should say, probably everybody knows this, but uh, Sawbill Lake is in the middle of the Superior National Forest. And um, anyway, a, a logging railroad was built across the forest and it passed six miles south of Sawbill. And very shortly thereafter, a trail was established with a, um, a one, a two line telephone, two wire telephone line, and it went up to Kelso Lake and the lookout tower was erected. This is sometime, I believe, in the early 20s. And so there was a trail up to Sawbill, some canoes were stashed there, and then the, the keepers of the lookout tower would canoe over to Kelso Lake, just two portages away, and, and uh, man the tower. And shortly after that, uh, some enterprising young men in Tofty brought a couple of old fishing boats up kind of abandoned fishing boats and left them at the south end of Sawbill and they would rent them out to people that were game to ride the railroad up and then hike into Sawbill and go fishing. Um, Seymour Tofty told me that story, so uh, you can take it with a grain of salt if you want to. But um, eventually a road was constructed from Tofty north and it finally pushed into Sawbill probably about in 1932, late 1931 or, or early 1932. It's a little bit, a little bit unclear. And shortly thereafter, the, uh, that was about the time that the CCC was getting going. There was a CCC camp nearby, so they constructed this campground. And this is a, one of the old campsites. It's not a campsite anymore, but on the south end of Sawbill. And this is how people camped back in those days. Now I see the arrow. Yay. I threw this in. This is a sign. I think Brian Tofty dug this up somewhere. A historic sign. This must have been very early 30s. And... Uh, is just obviously pointing up the Sawbill Trail, uh, 20 miles to Wanless. I don't know exactly what that means. Uh, Wanless is, lake is more over by Finland and I think it's more than 20 miles, but, and they have the Sawbill Lodge and Sawbill Campground. So this was in the, probably around 1935, I would say. They also have Pluff Resort, 17 miles up. And uh, my historian friend, Brian Henry tells me that that was a resort on the Sawbill Trail on Pluff Creek run by Bill Ploof, he pronounced it, and it's since become Pluff. Um, and Brian was able, before it uh, disappeared, was able to find and document that old resort that disappeared shortly after this picture was taken. So then in 1932, really the first European pioneers came to Sawbill in the form of Sawbill Lodge. And uh, this was the lodge, um, a beautiful hand-built log building, very large. Um, built right on the south end of Sawbill Lake with an expansive view of the lake. And uh, really our history is intertwined with, with this. We're, we're a separate business, always have been, and I'll talk more about that later. But uh, so Sawbill Lodge started, they started working on it in 1932 and I think opened in 34 for the first season, summer of 34 is, is best I know. This is another view of the, uh, of the lodge taken from below. Um, and then this is the interior of the lodge. This is the lounge area. Uh, you can see the massive fireplace that we saw from the outside. The lake would be over on the left here. Uh, this table on the left um, that you can see in the chair, uh, I have those in my office and I still use those as my office to this day. Um, and it says underneath and written in pencil that it was built from a kit by uh, uh, one of the, the children of the first founder of the Sawbill Lodge. Uh, beautiful lodge. If you want to see it, it still exists. It's been, it was dismantled and moved to Solbakken Resort in Lutzen. So if you're ever going by, they're happy to have you stop in. It's, you know, it's set up a little differently, but the original building is the old Sawbill Lodge. This is taken from the same angle looking the other way very early on. Um, one of the stories about the lodge is that they, uh, they got in a hurry when they were building it and they ended up putting the roof on and I think ran out of logs and they put the roof on and then when it shrunk, these beams that you see up here were lower than six feet. So anybody that was more than six feet tall had to duck, learn to duck under those beams. And almost everybody hit their head the first couple of times and then learned from then on to duck under the beams. When Solbakken rebuilt it, they raised the beams so it's no longer an issue. But, and then this is the founder of Sabi Lodge on the left, uh, Jean Riken uh, was her name when this picture was taken. Uh, her maiden name was Jean Bettis. She was from Chicago. and uh, she built it with her first husband, um, uh, Robert Arbogast. And uh, he was, uh, uh, the story with them, Jean was a remarkable woman. 
And I want to just pause and say a few things about her because I'm distressed to find that almost no one remembers Jean and she had a tremendous impact on Cook County. Um, she, um, she was uh, the, the second woman in history to graduate from the Cornell School of Hotel Motel Management. And she actually had her diploma displayed in her house and it was literally on a sheepskin, on, a, on an actual sheepskin and written in um, calligraphy. It said, this diploma certifies that this man has completed his uh, you know, course of studies to be certified as a hotel motel manager. And she had crossed it out and wrote woman underneath it. <laughs> so she was an early feminist and a pretty amazing woman all the way around. She was the boss, uh, no question about it. Um, so the story of her, and I'm sorry, uh, George Arbogast was her first husband's name, um, George Arbogast. So the, the story was that during the depression, Jean, right after she got out of college, during the depression, she had to take a job as a social worker in Chicago because that was the only job she could get. And one of her assignments was to sent out to investigate a single father, George Arbogast, who had five children at home. His wife had died and he was out of work and had five children ranging in age from at that time like 15 or 16 down. And um, George Jr., who went by Nibs, um, was the 16 year old. Uh, and Jean went out and basically she had the assignment of taking the children away and putting them into foster care because at that time nobody, no father could raise five children alone, especially if he was unemployed. Instead, she became friends with George and uh, eventually uh, Nibs got a job, a summer job at Hungry Jack Lodge on the Gunflint Trail as a 16 or 17 year old. And uh, that was the year after they had their first fire and they were rebuilding a log lodge. And when he came home from for school that year, he said they, the, the social services was uh, suspicious that this young social worker was not following through on her assignment and uh, threatened to come send somebody else to take the kids. And so they kind of hatched a plan to escape together and uh, go to Northern Minnesota and build a wilderness lodge. And they found an opportunity at Sawbill Lake where the road had just gone in and the Forest Service was willing to help them and actually lease them land on a 99 year lease. And she came up, she married George, uh, even though she was you know, only a few years older than his oldest son and came up with the kids and they built the lodge over the following year. And uh, it's a huge story in itself, could go on for many hours. She was always gonna write a book and I regret that she never did. Uh, she eventually succumbed to Alzheimer's and was in the nursing home here for many years in Grand Marais. But um, she was, uh, uh, just one more historical thing about her is she was a county commissioner and was the first woman to chair a county commission in in uh, Minnesota, also ran for the legislature, I think two, at least two times that I know of. Um, the gentleman on the right is also a remarkable human being. That's Dick Riken. His real name, his given name was Toivo Richard Reikonen, but he short, he Americanized it to Dick Riken. And he was a guide at the lodge. Uh, Jean and, jo and George uh, divorced. And according to her, that was the plan all along that their marriage was a marriage of convenience and that the lodge was, she had the money and the expertise and that he basically supplied the manpower and then they were gonna divorce when the economy improved and he was gonna go back into the advertising business. Um, his family disputes that, so who knows? There was obviously a complicated situation, but she divorced George. He died within the year after she divorced him, a very young age of cancer. Um, and, uh, and then she married Dick, who was one of her guides. Dick was born and raised on the Iron Range and was uh, obviously a Finn and uh, an incredible woodsman. He had just deep, deep knowledge of, of the woods and was an amazing human being. And both these people were taught me a lot and I owe much to them as do my parents. Uh, this is kind of a, there were a couple other things going on at, at uh, Sawbill at, at that time. I mentioned the, this cabin that was built. This is actually the second cabin that the Forest Service built. Uh, originally, this was the headquarters of the Tofte uh, Forest Service District uh, for a while, but they had to hike in um, to it. There was a smaller cabin, and if you ever ski at the Onion River uh, ski area in Tofte, uh, you'll see a small cabin there that's a warming house, and that's actually the original cabin at Sawbill Lodge. Uh, this one was built in the 30s to replace it and is still there and is still used by the Forest Service to house forest uh, portage crews. 
um, and it still looks very much like this. This is when it was new, but it's been well taken care of and well uh, preserved and restored. So um, beautiful cabin. Now, this is kind of a weird picture. It's two pictures. Um, this is a, what we call the dynamite shack. And uh, this was built by the Forest Service, I'm not sure when, um, up in the woods in the middle of nowhere at Sawbill to um, store dynamite. The Forest Service used to use dynamite a lot. So it's, uh, it's made out of metal. It's kind of hard to tell, but galvanized metal. It was originally painted orange, blaze orange, but it's faded to pink, ironically. Uh, still there to this day. Um, and as you can see by the open door, it has very thick walls. And it, um, the walls are filled with uh, their, their uh, wood frame, but they're filled with gravel. And then underneath it, there's a deep hole. And then the roof is very flimsy, just a very lightweight wooden frame with a galvanized roof on it. And the theory was that if the dynamite blew up, most of the force of the blast would go down and up and uh, people standing you know, within half a mile wouldn't be killed. I don't know if that was ever tested, but uh, there was a, a blasting cap shack that was a little smaller that was kept two miles away. Uh, and that was uh, destroyed by a logger back in the in the 80s at the direction of the Forest Service. But this one still persists out in the woods. It's pretty cool. And um, they stopped using it in the early 1970s or actually the late 60s when there were a number of campus bombings, including the University of Wisconsin, a time of unrest during the Vietnam War. And people were stealing dynamite and blowing up buildings. And uh, the Forest Service, somebody stole the dynamite out of this building and the FBI got involved and was very nervous and they stopped storing dynamite there. And in fact, the Forest Service doesn't use dynamite very much anymore, but, um, but we found out later or soon that the dynamite was just stolen by local people that uh, were using it to you know, blow stuff up for fun. So. Uh, so here my parents arrived and their story, so this is the beginning of the Sawbill Outfitters era. My parents' story, here they are consulting with Gene, um, Frank and Mary Alice Hansen. Um, they, Frank grew up in the camping business. From the time he was a baby, his parents ran children's camps in Maryland, um, right on the West Virginia border. And uh, they, were my, they were teachers and they ran the camps in the summer. And so my dad grew up at this camp, literally from the time he was a baby until he was out of graduate school and was a professor at the University of Minnesota in Duluth. Uh, my parents met in graduate school. My mom was from Kansas. My dad was from Baltimore, lived in Baltimore during the school year. And uh, they had, uh, even when I was born, by the time I was born, they were still going out to run the camp every year with my grandparents. And I went two years, I don't remember, because I was one and two, but um, they, um, they, they were under the assumption that they would take over the camps eventually, and we probably would have moved out to, uh, to Maryland to do that, but um, uh, then my grandparents didn't, didn't get that message and sold the camps. And so my folks found themselves living in Duluth and my dad just couldn't bear the idea of not having a business in the summer and being outdoors and being with children. And so he proposed to my mother that they start a children's camp in Northeastern Minnesota uh, near the, what was then called the roadless area and kind of centered around canoeing. The camp in Maryland was centered around equestrian activities, horses basically. So it was a camp for, private camp for rich kids basically from DC and Philadelphia. So they hatched that plot and they started looking around for land for a camp and soon realized that the market wasn't very good um, and that their plan wasn't a very good one, but they stumbled across the Forest Service, steered them to Sawbill Lake and Gene Riken because Gene was starting to think about retirement. This is in 1955, 56, that they had these discussions. And Sawbill Lodge was getting a lot of demand for canoe outfitting, and she knew that that was a viable business, but she didn't want to do it. So she essentially recruited my parents to start an outfitter uh, to the side of the lodge. And the first year, the year this picture was taken, they actually ran the outfitter out of a small cabin at the lodge. And uh, so they went into business with six canoes, three little children. I was three years old when they started. Um, my brother and sister are five and six years older than me. Um, we lived in a cabin, one room cabin with no running water and an outhouse. It was a two seater. And um, we had uh, six canoes and, you know, 10 sleeping bags, something like that. And the entire take, the entire gross receipts for the summer were $300 and it was stolen at the end of the season. And somebody broke in and took the cash box and 
stole the money. So uh, <laughs> it wasn't a very auspicious start, but, uh, but Gene was a great mentor to them and had a lot of experience and you know, knew the business and uh, was able to help them a lot. I asked my mother uh, one time, actually after she published her history, I said to her, what the heck were you thinking? You know, you were young, you had three children, you had no money, you had no experience with canoeing or, or wilderness camping, and yet you started this business. And she gave the, the classic entrepreneur's response. She said, well, it was never on the table to not do it. <laughs> so they just did it. And uh, boy, am I grateful they did. So in 1958, the next year, that next winter, they built this building. And this is, this is still the building that Sawbill is housed in today, although it looks quite a bit different now. It's been through a, a few major remodels and a really major remodel, I think in 2000, 2001, something like that. Um, but this was the building they built. It was, if you look at the building and you see the, um, it's, it's logs up until about four feet and then uh, board and batten, you know, framing above that. It was supposed to be all logs but somebody miscalculated, probably my dad, he used to say somebody, miscalculated when they ordered the logs. And uh, when they started putting them up, they got up four feet and ran out of logs. So they just framed it, um, uh, you know, with standard carpentry framing above that. Uh, they scavenged the windows, they scavenged a lot of the materials, did it on the cheap, and uh, had some structural problems, which we had to correct later, which explains the, uh, the remodeling, but anyway, it's a great building. At this time, when this picture was taken, uh, we lived in this in the portion to the left here. The store was in this section, and then back here was the outfitting department. So it's kind of like it is today. This is my family in in that year. Uh, this was our first year when we were still at the lodge, 1957. I had just turned four. Obviously, I'm the little one. My sister Rana and my brother Carl. Uh, and both Rana and Carl live in Grand Marais now. So um, uh, you may know them if you're from here or if you're in Grand Marais, you can look out for them, but they're still around. Um, this was our first family canoe trip. And uh, even it took the dachshund, as you can see in my mother's arms there, that's a dachshund, it's kind of hard to tell, but it's a very funny picture. This is taken on the Sawbill Lodge dock. That first summer, uh, they couldn't afford to have both of them working in the business because the business earned so little money. So my dad actually worked as the dock boy for the lodge, renting boats and motors and selling minnows and, and that kind of thing. And my mom ran the outfitter. And this is me that same year. Um, I remember that day I, uh, that they had that inner tube down there, I guess, for swimming. And they always made me wear a life jacket because I fell in four or five times a day off the dock. And that particular day, it was very warm and I was curled up in the life jacket, just kind of biding my time. And then it was so comfortable, I fell fast asleep and they took this picture. Um, this boat in the background in the, on the right is I think one of the original boats that the Tofty brothers bought, brought up. They were not being used anymore, but they were just kind of still there, sort of half derelict wooden boats. And the boat on the left is interesting. That was a very, very early fiberglass boat, one of the first fiberglass boats ever made. And you can kind of see through it like you can see through a a Kevlar canoe nowadays. So. so it was kid heaven on that dock, I'll tell you, for me. This is my parents later in life. And uh, of course, I owe everything to them, as many who are on this call do. <laughs> and uh, they were awesome, awesome people. And I, I really think my dad's, um, I mean, just they were, they were uh, very personable, um, you know, lovely, loving people um, that really liked interacting with people. They were both child psychologists, as I said, they met in graduate school. And they, um, so they, they were good at the business. But I think my dad's camping background is what really gave Sawbill its, its uh, unusual flavor that it still has to this day. And that he sort of fostered those kind of traditions that they have in camps of, of um, if any of you have been to camp, you know, um, there are many, many traditions, the camp song and many, things that happen every year that have happened for years and, and it really brings people together and bonds them. From the beginning, our employees lived with us uh, because we're too remote um, to have them commute. So uh, it was like camp in that respect too, and that we lived and worked together and became very, very close. And to this day, uh, probably half the people on this call are former uh, crew members of Sawbill and they're uh, they're still like family after all this time. And I really give my parents credit for setting that up. And, and uh, hopefully we, we kept it going and, uh, and our, our successors will keep it going as well. 
this is the building today. Um, so that's that same old building, but just much, much remodeled, taken actually from the same direction and a bunch of Kevlar canoes lying out in front there for sale. This was actually, looks like it was taken back in, uh, would have been in 2014, I guess. So, um, um, but it's much what it looks like today, except a little modified because of the COVID thing. This is actually a postcard um, taken. Now I'm gonna morph a little bit in, you know, obviously we're into the Sawbill Outfitters history now. I'm gonna talk about the crew a little bit. So these were crew members. I'm not sure who was under the canoe. I always thought it was Carl, my brother, but I don't think it is. I think this is a crew member uh, with a pack called Rich, named Rich Hules Camp, worked for us for many years, but I'm quite sure that the, the bathing beauties here, I don't know who the blonde is, but the woman lying down in the front is Beth Moberg. And in the back, I'm pretty sure is Nancy Sealar, who lives in Grand Marais. So those of you from Grand Marais might know Nancy. And that's what she looked like in a bikini in 1962 or whenever this was taken. This is probably a little later than that, 67, 68, somewhere around there. Uh, there's a campground at Sawbill, a 50 site forest service campground. They have this lovely sign. And you can see the road heading up into the campground there. Uh, it started out as a nine site campground built by the CCC. And then in the early 60s, 1960, 61, the Forest Service built a 50 site campground, really beautiful campground. And uh, for the last 30 years almost, we've operated it on a concession contract. This is the famous campsite number five, which is the most popular campsite at Sawbill for obvious reasons. It's got a great view, it's level. Um, yeah, beautiful trees, uh, a lot of big pines at Sawbill, which is, of course, a blessing. Um, so this is a crew member, uh, Jessica Hemmer. She's now a manager at Sawbill and lives there full time <clears throat> and has for many years. I'm, I want to say 12 or 13 years now. Uh, she's lived there. She, um, wonderful person, but there's a lot going on in this picture. That's why I showed it is um, you can see the solar panels in the background. Sawbill it was when we started off the grid and so no telephone, no power, and it still is to this day. So we make all our own power up there and um, we have a microwave system, you know, basically a high tech radio system for the telephone and for high speed internet. Very, very expensive. So here, um, and then also we have to shovel the roofs on some of the buildings. So this is Jessica uh, several years ago now up shoveling pretty deep, deep uh, snow off the roof. And uh, uh, so I just wanted to include this to, to show that. And I can't find my arrow here, sorry. To go here. Uh, this is obviously a screenshot, another winter shot. Um, this is Kit, uh, my granddaughter. Uh, this is taken just last year, the year before. After shoveling the roof, you can see the kind of things we get on it here. And sorry, this is just not, uh, it's not giving me the arrows for some reason. Another winter shot here, this is the main building. Uh, seen in the winter a few years ago, so you can see all the snow we get. Uh, I think it's the vertical photos that don't have, a, oh, there it is, way over there. Another winter scene, um, lots and lots of stories about animals around Sawbill. I won't start on them now, but uh, if you want to ask me questions about that, I, have, I could uh, easily fill an hour and a half just with animal stories. This is obviously a pine marten right at the window, <laughs> which is very common in the winter. And so these are the next owners after Frank and Mary Alice Hansen. This is Bill and Cindy Hansen. Uh, this was taken a few years ago, but um, uh, when, when Kevlar canoes had come in, I can't remember why this picture was taken. It's obviously in the spring because there's a snowbank behind us there. But um, uh, we ran, basically my parents ran the business for 30 years and then we ran the business for 30 years and then we sold it to our daughter and son-in-law, Claire and Dan Shirley. And Hopefully they'll run it for 30 years, but that's that's up to them, of course. Uh, so crew members, um, of course, I can't begin to show the pictures of them all. We've had probably uh, in the neighborhood of 200, 150 to 200 crew members over the 64 years now that we've been in business. Um, this is one some of you may know, Brian Henry. He worked for the Forest Service, and after he retired, he's still to this day works for Sawbill Outfitters, uh, off and on anyway. Um, lived in Silver Bay, worked in Tofty, very cheerful and well-known character in the area. And here he is doing a very typical uh, outfitter thing and tying canoes on a van. Um, every outfitter has a tent rack like this uh, where we hang up the tents to wash them out and let them dry. Um, 
that everyone's invented the same thing. It looks a little bit like a gallows, but um, it's, um, it's the necessity is the mother of invention. So every outfitter basically has invented the same rack to, uh, to dry their tents. Just part of what's done. No slideshow would be complete without some uh, scantily clad uh, young women and, and, and some nudity, which comes in the next picture. Um, this is some crew members from a few years ago. The reason I included this wasn't, wasn't for the bikinis, but for the, uh, the site. This is an airplane dock that the Forest Service has at, their, at the cabin that I showed you earlier, which is just up the lake from Sawbill. And it's known by the, the tradition at Sawbill is that it's called the Sawbill Beach Club. And it's a place where people go to swim and hang out. So that's what I'm demonstrating here. This is a recent picture because the dog is uh, um, Huckleberry, who is the current sawbill dog. And then this is another tradition, another great sawbill tradition, which is where anybody who's there in the spring uh, has to jump in the water the day the ice goes out. And so this was, again, I think 2016, probably, right around there. Uh, jumping in the water. You can see Brian over here on the right. This is my son-in-law, Dan, here, uh, Phil, and then this is me on the left. And uh, you can see I'm churning up the water pretty good in my haste to get out of the, uh, <laughs> out of the, uh, out of the water. It's definitely a, I can't believe Dan's like swimming around out there because that water is 32.01 degrees. <laughs> but uh, again, just to show the camaraderie among the crew and the kind of many, many traditions that we have amongst the crew. This is just sort of a, some, some beauty relief. This was actually taken on Alton by Paul Sundberg. You can see his watermark down below. Uh, he, I traded him uh, canoe rental for the rights to use this picture. Um, and it's a little fuzzy blown up like this, but uh, Paul takes pretty good pictures. Um, so just another one of the beauty of the Boundary Waters. Talked about being off the grid. So we've always made our own power. We've used generators uh, mostly over that time, uh, diesel generators. But we did have a wind generator that we put in, oh gosh, 1971, maybe 72, something like that. And it ran for 13 years. It was made in Australia. Um, pretty long time for a generator, wind generator back in those days. Um, they were pretty unreliable back then, but this one happened to be quite reliable. But eventually it just wore out and we weren't able to get parts for it. Uh, so we abandoned, took the wind generator off the tower and put um, an antenna up for a radio phone in, instead on that tower. Tower's gone now, but there's one similar in its place. And then in 19, gosh, I think in 19, I think what these were put in in 1990, but we put in our first solar system on the roof, the one you saw behind Jessica when she was uh, shoveling in like 1980, maybe even a little earlier than that. Uh, I can't remember. So we've been on solar up there for a long, long time. And I, it makes me want to throw up when I think about what I paid for those first solar panels, um, although they paid for themselves many times over, but they were 10 times more expensive than they are now. Um, and then this was an addition to the system later. These are solar panels on trackers. This still is providing a lot of power for Sawbill. We have about, uh, about 10 kW of, of uh, solar capacity there. And we use all the solar power and then the diesel generators or the, actually now we have small uh, propane generators that we capture the heat off of for domestic hot water. Uh, all the heat is centralized to all the buildings there. It's quite a nice and efficient system. Uh, very, still very expensive, but we've made it so efficient that it's uh, fairly comparable with, uh, with the power and utilities that you all have. <laughs> and uh, uh, other than the kind of the hassle of uh, maintaining it, uh, it works very well and is very transparent. Most people at Sawbill don't realize that we don't have a wire running in. Heat with wood, I mentioned the central heating system. So we have two high, very, very high efficiency wood boilers from Denmark and uh, that burn, that capture 80 some percent of the heat out of the wood and produce no smoke to speak of, um, just a little wisp of steam. Um, they're amazing. We've had those for well over 20 years, 25 years, probably right on the verge of replacement. Um, but they do, we burn about 10 cords of maple or birch uh, every season. Uh, but that's heating, keeping five buildings heated and uh, um, yeah, you know, pretty big, pretty big area. So uh, it's efficient and works well. Uh, this is a new building, but replaced an old building where we did the same thing. And this is how we store the canoes in the winter. 
And um, I think this is Dan here. Uh, this is last winter. This building was new and they're putting the canoes in or maybe the winter before for the first time uh, and able to stand them up very efficiently and keep them out of harm's way. And this, these are the current owners. So Dan Shirley on the left, Claire Shirley on the right, uh, Sig Shirley with the blue life jacket and uh, Kit Shirley down below. So this is the, the uh, third generation and the fourth generation. Um, I don't want to put any pressure on these kids, but uh, I sure hope one of them wants to take over the business. It would be fun to keep it going for a fourth, a fourth generation. They've been running it now for, we sold it to them four or five years ago. Uh, worked with them closely for a couple of years. And now this year, for the first time, we're not working there at all. Well, for me last summer too, because I was in Uganda, but um, they're actually keeping us away from Sawbill deliberately because if one of the, if anybody on the crew, because they all live together, gets COVID, then everyone has to stop working. And so they're keeping us pure. So if that happens, heaven forbid, uh, we can come up and jump in and run the business for them. I had to have a, a picture of the grandkids, each one separate. This is a kit on, at the beach club, catching a nice bass there that she caught. I don't know if that's her first fish, but uh, uh, she's definitely into fishing. Kit loves it at Sawbill and it, so I think she's a good prospect for taking over. And then this is Sig. Hard, hard to know yet if he's a prospect. He loves it too, but he's only two, so hasn't had much to say about it yet. And then this is just, uh, this is taken in the campground, actually, a picture of Sawbill Lake. I'm not even sure who took the picture, but gorgeous picture. And I think I put that in. Oh, this is the last slide. Um, so if you're really interested in Sawbill history, my mom wrote a book called Sawbill History and Tales, and this is it. It's a really good book. And I, I say that not just because she's my mother, but it actually is a good book. Um, it's a very personal memoir. And uh, she, I'll use the same disclaimer for this talk that she uses at the beginning of the book. She said, a memoir it, by definition is personal memories. So they may not always be completely accurate because memories can be altered over time or you know, misremembered or, uh, so I'll use that same disclaimer. Um, my family calls it enhancing, but uh, I am trying to be as accurate as I can, but uh, it's possible that I might uh, get something wrong. I just wanna, just want to throw out that disclaimer. So if you're interested in getting the book, you can go on the sawbill.com website and order the book there. And I, I recommend it. It's, it is actually a very good read. So let's see, that's it. Do I wonder how I get back? And I guess you all can see me. So um, so that's about it. I've, uh, in terms of history, that obviously very, very brief history. Um, I have a lot more I can talk about, but I thought I would throw it to questions to see um, if anybody has uh, has any questions. And I am unmuting people that you will have to unmute yourself as well. Um, you could have the chance to speak out loud or you can type into the Q&A section or in the chat function. Um, it'll just be a second as I allow people to talk because there's so many people. Um, okay. One second. I see there are a few questions already. Oh, uh, somebody mentions uh, Ogama Lake. Uh, oh, and they, they're just saying that uh, Oshki Ogama is the name of the school in Grand Portage, which means leaders of tomorrow. So I might not have the translation quite, quite right. But, um, but anyway, it has changed from Ogama to uh, Omega, which I think happened fairly frequently in those days when they, I mean, even the very name of the Ojibwa people, they call themselves Anishinaabe, that somehow became Ojibwa and then Chippewa because uh, early Europeans couldn't pronounce it very well. Uh, uh, sorry, to let you know, we're also getting some questions in. Um, we have one from Jesse, um, which I will start out with you. One second. Um, you should be able to unmute yourself and go ahead with your talk. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, so I was out um, a couple weeks ago in the Boundary Waters and I was on my way to Ogama Lake and um, ran into, sorry, my dog is making noise in the back. I ran into a father and son who said they had just come from Ogama Lake. And I was so happy that they called it Ogama. Yeah. 
And they said that they called it Ogama because you told them that that ah. was the name. <laughs> Excuse me, maybe we can bring it back. It would be, yeah. I think it would be very appropriate to bring it back, actually. It's, it's, probably, it's probably officially still Ogama Lake. I would guess the state still has it as that, but on most maps now you'll see it says Omega. Yeah, so on my map it said Ogama, and oh, I good. saw that, yeah, every other map said Omega, so then I was confused, but because I, I, I know that Ogama means leader, I thought, I think it's Ogama. I bet at some point someone just assumed it was a misspelling and then changed it. So that's partly why I'm on this um, tonight, because I wanted to ask you if you knew huh. if well, I'm that- glad, I'm happened. glad I brought it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It looks like we have some more questions as well. Let's see, we have um, Tom, if you want to unmute yourself. Hey, Bill. Hi, Tom. How you doing? I'm doing great. Good story. I think I've heard most of it before, but I yeah. love it. <laughs> Maybe in a slightly different form. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you this, unrelated to history, um, uh, you're, you're really well noted for your management philosophy and theory and so on, uh, written up by Harvard, as I understand, and so on. Um, what of what did you use in Uganda that you had learned to do here uh, to deal with a different culture, but still trying to organize, what is it, uh, Mothers of Initiative? Uh, uh, friends of Mothers, yeah. <laughs> friends of Mothers, okay. I so, I mean, you must, you must have had some you must have had applied some of what you what you did at Sawbill to to adapt it to that culture to get them as organized as you did, and unfortunately not not still there, but fortunately still here. So yeah, what, well what let me unpack, let me unpack that a little bit. Um, so those of you that don't know, I in my retirement I joined the Peace Corps. And in June of 2019, I, was, I left and arrived in Uganda on June 2nd uh, to be an agribusiness, economic, and community development volunteer in eastern Uganda. And I ended up with an organization called Friends of Mothers Initiative that's basically a coffee cooperative. Um, I was in the mountains in the Mount Elgon region, high altitude, uh, reasonably high altitude, and that's where they grow some of the world's finest specialty coffee. So I was working with these, and the, the farmers are women, uh, thus the mothers, and um, they, uh, they're small subsistence farmers, but they grow coffee as a cash crop, but it's all done by hand, uh, dug with hose, planted by hand, harvested by hand, um, but that, gives, that allows them to cr create a quality that's uh, exceptional. It's among the best coffee in the world. And, uh, Unfortunately, uh, historically, all over the world, uh, coffee farmers have been very poorly paid, and that's certainly been the case in Uganda, too. So my job was to both help them to increase their profits, and from a business point of view, and then also once they started making money, which they were doing uh, pretty handily <laughs> after I'd been there for a while, not, not because of me so much, but just because of the, uh, the well-run organization that was already there when I got there, um, my job was to, part of that, they were fair trade certified and part of that was to take that, uh, some of the profit and reinvest it in the community. That's required by fair trade coffee. So um, the whole idea of fair trade is that the farmers are, the farmers in the communities benefit from the, the love of coffee that we have in America and in Europe and around the world. Ironically, they don't drink coffee in Uganda. Very, very few people drink it. It's a former British colony. So they all drink tea. But um, also, it's too valuable to drink because they sell it. So, uh, so anyway, that so that's one thing I was doing. The other thing I think Tom was referring to is something I wanted to address directly, which is the work system that remains to this day at Sawbill. And back in I think 1971, I was chatting with my mother about a utopian novel that I had to read in high school uh, called Walden Two. And if the older people on the call probably had to read it too, it was, I think it's kind of not in favor anymore, but and it was a utopian novel about, um, based around the uh, B.F. Skinner, uh, uh, written by B.F. Skinner, who was a psychologist who uh, was the founder of the behaviorist movement. And in the novel, there's a, there are literally two sentences that talk about 
it's the, the book is about a, a fictional um, uh, utopian community and uh, it takes the form of a reporter coming in and being toured around this community that's really, really working well for people. And uh, they talk about their work system and they said the way they did their work was that they reassigned all the jobs periodically and people bid on the jobs. And then they would analyze the bidding and jobs that were popular, according to the bidding, uh, were reduced in value and the jobs that were uh, unpopular were increased in value. So then in the next round of bidding, when you looked at the job, you had to decide whether or not you wanted to do that job based on whether it was high value or low value, as well as the intrinsic part of the job. And the theory is that people, if people select their own work and are valued, and the work is valued according to the preference of the community, so the unpopular work is essentially you're paid more, for unpopular work and paid less for popular work, that it'll balance itself out and everybody will be happy. Uh, that was the theory. So I was chatting with my mom about it. And one of us, I, I think probably her, uh, said, you know, that might work here <laughs> at Sawdell. <laughs> and so we got kind of excited about it and we worked up a system that did that very thing. So we took all the jobs at Sawbill, uh, including management jobs. So we the only thing that we really held out were like the long-term corporate planning, you know, should we build a building or that kind of thing. But all the jobs, you know, week to week, and we reassigned them every week. And then we assigned each job a value, which we call credits. And so we called the system work credit. So you worked for credit rather than pay, you know, you were still paid of course, but uh, uh, people at Sawbill since then have been paid a salary, um, not, a, not by the hour. So everybody gets the same. Um, <clears throat> but we assign the jobs value and credit and then people bid on the jobs. They're given a certain number of votes, which are different than credits. They get to vote for the job. So they get 70 credits for the week if they're working seven days and they can vote by putting the most number of votes onto the job they want to do most. And so they maybe put 25 on the job they want to do most, maybe 20 on the job they want to do second most, but they only can allocate 70 votes. So it goes down until they're putting one on jobs that they're willing to do. And then we feed it now, of course, and since 1980, we feed it all into the computer. And then the computer does the scheduling based on the preferences. And then it prints out, a, it analyzes the bidding <clears throat> and prints out a list of which jobs were popular and which jobs were unpopular. If a job is consistently popular, we lower the number of credits. If the job is consistently um, unpopular, we raise the credits. And it's, it's uh, according to the preference of the group. So I hope that was clear. It's a little bit complicated of a system, but it works like a charm. <laughs> and uh, we, even in the beginning when we were doing it by hand and it was quite a chore, it was like a three or four hour job for three or four people every week to do the scheduling. The computer sped it up a lot. Now it's about an hour job for one person on the computer, but it, um, it really worked. And people are really happy working under that system uh, because it turns out people's motivation for what job they do and why is highly variable and completely unpredictable. So the example I always give is, is in the first couple of weeks, we had a guy working for us. Um, um, some of you might even know him, uh, Hawk Jensen from Silver Bay. He was a kid from Silver Bay, right? Grew up in a working class family. At that time was a high school dropout. He eventually went back to college, but high school dropout, bit of a ne'er-do-well, but he, uh, we had hired him because he was basically a friend of mine. And, um, very bright guy, but he was assigned before this system, he was assigned really menial jobs. So he did a lot of floor sweeping and trash taking out and canoe washing. And, you know, he did jobs that were basically unskilled and jobs that we sort of in a prejudicial way thought, you know, were appropriate for him. Whereas my dad did all the management jobs because he was the owner, right? So he did the management. Well, within about two weeks, uh, my dad was signing up for all the so-called menial jobs, like sweeping the floors and washing the windows and uh, taking the trash out, because he loved doing that kind of stuff. And Hawk was signing up for the managerial jobs, like running the office, answering the phone, you know, uh, dealing with customers, uh, because it turned out he loved that and was very good at it. And so the, um, that, that's always the most stark example I can think of, of how you just cannot predict why, why people want to do certain jobs. And it turns out some people love to do the same jobs all the time and get really good at it and are comfortable with just having everything the same. Other people are 
are really interested in doing something different every week and just want to try everything and, and learn that way or what, for whatever reason. Some people are motivated by the fact that they love to sleep in in the morning so they don't take jobs that start before 10 a.m. Some people love to get up early. Some people love to fish in the evening so they never sign up for, you know, it's just all over the map and it's, it's not a true, we also, before work credit, we uh, often, like most businesses, sort of put women in women's roles and men's in so-called men's roles <laughs> uh, because that's how the society works. And uh, it turns out those roles are meaningless and uh, women can do and want to do all jobs and men can and want to do all jobs. And so the gender uh, roles went out the window very quickly um, and people were just very, very happy. We did have, you know, we had some, it's a complicated system and uh, there's some things that have to happen. For instance, all the jobs have to get done every week. So after the sign up happens, after the bidding is, is done, there are always a few jobs left over that nobody bid on. Those would be the unpopular jobs. So that week, and then there are people who haven't filled out their work week yet. So they get stuck with those jobs. And going back to Hawk from Silver Bay, he called that getting snoosed, <laughs> which was the vernacular of Silver Bay at the time. He'd say, oh my gosh, I got snoosed this week with a job I didn't want. So to this day, we call those jobs snooze jobs. And if you are snoosed with a job, then you get what are called snooze credits. So you get free credits. So basically free time off or free pay, however you want to look at it as some compensation for taking the job that nobody wanted for that week. But if a job, as I mentioned, if it stays consistently unpopular, it, then it goes up in credit and then it becomes popular because it's a, it's a good deal credit, credit wise. So, so we started that system in 1971, I think, or right around there, 72, and uh, still used to this day, still loved by, uh, by the employees, I think. Um, over the years with all the employees, 150 or so employees we've had, there have been one or two that really didn't like it. And they just wanted some, they were people that just wanted uh, somebody to tell them what to do. And uh, there are people like that out in the world. So there are, you know, nothing fits everybody, but far and away the vast majority of people love working under the work credit system. And most people I think will, uh, that work at Sawbill, I've heard it over and over again from former Sawbill crew members that it was the best job they ever had and it kind of ruined them for regular hierarchical workplaces. <laughs> They've been a little bitter all through their careers about not having this uh, great system to work under where you can actually do what you want to do. So, um, so there's that and I think that's what Tom was referring to. That's kind of the most unique management <clears throat> style. The other thing is I talked about earlier, my parents just were really good at working with people and um, I think that goes back just to their personalities and the camping experience. And uh, they were just very loving, very kind people that um, uh, fun and, and interesting and they, uh, they just made it a good place to work. And I think I actually took more from that to Uganda than obviously I didn't implement work credit on the coffee farms. So they're not quite ready for that yet um, there, but, um, but they did really teach me and I think all of us that worked for them to be accepting of people as people and work credit really, you know, illustrates that so clearly that you quickly sort of lose your, your prejudices about who should be doing what in the workplace. And that really paid off for me going into an alien culture and, uh, you know, to a very, very different culture in Africa. It just made me, I think, way more open to accepting the culture for what it was being become part of it. And uh, it made me much more effective as a volunteer, as a Peace Corps volunteer. Unfortunately, COVID, uh, as it has affected everybody, uh, kicked me out of Uganda as it kicked out every Peace Corps volunteer. 7,300 of us worldwide were evacuated at the end of March. And so I'm home now in Grand Marais, um, having a lot of fun, but uh, basically waiting to go back to Uganda as soon as I can and finish my service. I've, I served 10 months and I have 17 more months to finish up. So. It looks like you have some other great questions. One of the ones is, who were your closest neighbors? Well, we didn't really, well, originally Sawbill Lodge was our neighbor and it was actually, and I, oh, I wanted to mention that. So Dick and Jean sold the lodge in 1960. So pretty shortly after we came, they sold the place and they sold it to two couples from Chicago. They kept it, they did pretty well, ran it pretty well for a few years and they sold it and then it sold again. And then finally it just kind of, uh, went out of business. And um, that was a time that was in the mid 70s. It was actually closed for 
I want to say three seasons, maybe four seasons. And it was a time when um, those types of lodges were struggling. Um, and also it had aged to the point where it needed a lot of maintenance and the new owners hadn't done a good job of maintaining it. So there's a lot of deferred maintenance and basically it just wasn't a, a going business anymore, it had been let go. And then a couple from Madison, Wisconsin, um, Alan Sparrow-Senti came in and, and uh, took it over basically for next to nothing in an attempt to revive it and actually had the capacity to do that. And if Senti sounds like a familiar name to you, it's because my neighbors right now in Grand Marais are Mike and Lori Senti, and this was Mike's folks. And actually Lori worked for us and Mike was, had, was the caretaker year round while his parents still had jobs. Uh, they were also teachers. And um, um, so Lori took a semester off one year and was at Sawville very early in the spring by herself. And Mike was over at the lodge by himself and nature took its course. And they have three, three children and a bunch of grandchildren. And <laughs> so the rest is history, as they say. So um, um, anyway, I wanted just to bring up that history because um, the Sentis, uh, although they put a massive amount of work into re uh, renovating the lodge and did a really good job and it probably would have survived and been a very successful resort now, um, they had the opportunity under the 1978 Boundary Waters Act to require the government to buy them out. Well, at that point, they put a lot of sweat equity but very little cash equity into the business and the Forest Service had to buy them out at fair market value, which is a technical term. They just kind of measure the buildings and come up with a figure. So they had an opportunity to really, um, you know, make a lot of money by selling it out. And uh, Al, Mike and Lori were against it, wanted to keep running it. And but Al and Sparrow were near retirement age, and it was just too good of an opportunity to pass up. So they they sold it to the Forest Service, and it was torn down. And um, as many resorts were around the area under that program, but it wasn't a buyout. They weren't forced out. They had to they had to ask for a for a sellout. And Mike and Lori went into the log building business uh, based on their experience with maintaining the log buildings at Sabu Lodge and were, were and are, they're, they're kind of retired now, but they're very successful contractors here in Cook County, built many, many log buildings here and other places and still continue. I think Mike still works uh, just because he wants to. Um, so yeah, I forget the question, but hopefully that was the answer. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, next up is what advertising was done to get people to know about Sawbill? Well, that's an interesting story too. Uh, Sawbill Lodge, you know, started right at the, in the height of the depression, you know, 1933 or tail end of the depression, but things were dire. And um, uh, George Arbogast was an advertising man. And so they had zero money. And uh, here they had built this lodge in the middle of nowhere and really no way, you know, I mean, this is long before television, radio wasn't even a big thing. And, um, you know, they really had no, they couldn't afford newspaper advertising or magazine advertising or even sports shows if they even existed then. And so he came up with a scheme where he, he was able to talk his, um, his old ad agency into sharing with him the, the top executives from the top corporations in the Midwest. They had a mailing list and he, I don't know if he, if he surreptitiously borrowed it or if they gave it to him, but somehow he got his hands on this list. And he sent out, um, he had this brilliant idea. He purchased, at that time you could, and maybe you still can, buy blank postcards from the post office. And they're just very plain little cards. In those days, they, they came pre-stamped and the whole thing cost like two cents or three cents, including the stamp. And so he bought a couple, few hundred of those cards and he just, hand wrote on them, he hand addressed them, and then hand wrote like one word. And it said the first time, the first week it said, Sawbill Lodge, you know, uh, smell the pines. And then he sent it off and it was very enigmatic. And most people probably threw it away. And then a week later, he sent another one says, Sawbill Lodge, fantastic fishing, sent it off. <laughs> people, and he did that for a number of iterations, each time adding a little bit of information and by the end of the series, you know, it had been made, revealed where it was and how you made reservations. And, and it was fabulously successful and was actually taught in the advertising courses for years and years afterwards. And it was a brilliant, very cheap, very homegrown guerrilla <laughs> advertising campaign um, that he sort of invented out of whole cloth. And uh, 
uh, really had a huge for direct mail usually has a one or two percent uh, you know response rate if it's uh, if it's highly successful and and his response rate was was uh, you know up up in the double digits uh, percentage and eventually the place became almost a private club and it was open to the public but people made their bookings a year in advance the same people came every year stayed in the same cabin some people stayed the whole summer some people stayed for a month or six weeks um, many many and it was even though it was very rustic, um, originally no running water and, you know, outhouses, uh, it was American plan. So they had a dining room and uh, Gene was an excellent cook and excellent manager. And they, um, so they had a very wealthy clientele because it was kind of cool to rough it in those days. And it was sort of the, the beginnings of the wilderness movement, if you were, they, people were really there. Again, the lodge was unique and beautiful and well run and convivial, but people were really there because it was this gorgeous, gorgeous wilderness where they could go out and fish and hang out. Part of their stay at the lodge was to go on a canoe trip. And so the lodge had canoes, wooden canvas canoes, and they would send you out during your stay. You'd go out for three or four nights with a guide, uh, often an Indian guide. And that's what uh, uh, Dick Riken was. Uh, he was he was not a, not a Native American, but they, they employed very knowledgeable uh, woodsmen that took people out on these canoe trips and you really needed a guide in those days there were no maps and uh, they knew where the campsites were and knew the country so um, um, so that was the history of advertising for them uh, by the time we came along it was much more you know sports shows magazines uh, and um, yeah, mostly sports shows and magazines actually um, some direct mail we did direct mail every year for many many years but gradually as time went on and we saw less and less return from the sports shows because we focused purely on wilderness. Um, so we didn't have places to stay. It wasn't luxury. Uh, it wasn't even guided. It was just come get the gear, get instructed, and then go on your own out in the wilderness. And part of wilderness is sort of exclusivity. Like everybody, everybody, the best wilderness is the wilderness that only you and I know about, and I'm not so sure about you. You know, <laughs> it'd be better if I just knew about it. And so that it's kind of like a, a, an unknown Caribbean island. You know, if you vacation there, you don't want the rest of the world to know about it. So it became clear to us that by doing really high impact um, sort of public advertising, we might have we were actually kind of hurting our our brand. And so we very quickly. Um, uh, pulled away from uh, magazine advertising, pulled out of sports shows, which we just weren't seeing a return on and were grueling to do and expensive, and uh, went to uh, went to very, very targeted um, magazine advertising, very low key and mostly word of mouth, and then uh, one or two direct mail pieces every year, usually two, one at Christmas time and one in the spring with our new price list. And of course, 99% of our our new customers came through word of mouth. And my parents had a, a really crazy uh, business philosophy. It sounds even more crazy in 2020 in that they believed that you provide a very, very excellent service. Just do the very, very best job you can in providing the service you offer and do it at a fair price that gets you a profit but doesn't ever uh, take advantage of people. And I don't know how many thousands and thousands of times I heard people, they'd walk around our store and look at the prices and then they'd come up to me and say, you know, you could be charging quadruple for all this stuff because you have a captive market. The nearest store is 24 miles away. And we, and I would just say, well, that's not our philosophy. We just take a fair markup and we try to, you know, be fair to people. And we feel like that's better for business in the long run. That gets back to Tom's question too, is, you know, that's, that's what I preach in business all along. Nowadays, it's sort of seems like everybody's trying to angle for a super advantage where they can take advantage and, 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 essentially steal from you. And I really dislike that. I think uh, I, I'd like to see business get back to that, those bedrock values that my really human values that my parents had. So we got a lot of people are wanting to know about animal stories. So do you have one or two most memorable or? <laughs> ones? Um, well, uh, I, one that is probably most vivid in my mind, <laughs> because it happened to me was, um, uh, I was, I went to one spring, I went to an outfitters meeting. Um, there was, there's an, I don't know if it's still around, but there used to be an association of outfitters in Cook County. And we were having a meeting and uh, uh, was at Gunflint Lodge at the Kerfoot's house. So Bruce, Bruce and Sue Kerfoot's house. So 
I drove up there for the meeting and we had the meeting was fine, you know, whatever the issues of the day were. And um, of course, it always were, I always listened keenly to what the Kerfoots had to say because they were uh, very good operators and uh, good in the business here. And um, but at the end of the, I was literally leaving the, the house. I had said good night and I was, it was in the evening and I, I was pushing the door open to the screen door to go outside. And I heard Bruce say to somebody else, had a really weird thing happen last night. I was coming home up the Gunflint and there was a moose on the road, which was routine, of course, really routine in those days. And he said, I stopped, which is the proper thing to do to let it get off the road. And he said, the darn thing charged me, came right at me. Would have climbed up on my car. I said, he said, I had to slam it in reverse and, and go backwards for almost half a mile with this moose chasing me. He said, all the years he'd been there, his mother had been there since the 20s. That had never happened to him. So I stopped to actually listen to this story. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. I've never heard of that. Moose, very docile usually. Sometimes they were reluctant to get off the road, but they never, ever would chase you. So, and this was in the spring, you know, it wasn't even, um, it was in June, I think, or late May. Not, not in the rut or anything. So I got in the car and was headed home. And the quickest way to get to Sawbill from the Gunflint is to go down to the golf course north of Grand Marais and then take what's called the grade road across, which is a gravel road that goes east-west across to the Sawbill Trail. Very remote road with very little development on it. So I was a few miles into the grade road and came around a corner and here in my headlights, by then it was pitch dark, was a moose in the road. So I stopped well back. I mean, I was probably nearly a quarter of a mile from the moose, but I was well-trained. I stopped and, and sat and waited for it to get off the road. And it, 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 at first I thought it was a cow and then I realized that it was a bull, but its antlers were so small that they were kind of hidden by its ears. And it was not a super healthy looking uh, bull kind of skinny, but in the spring, that's that's sometimes the case. And but I didn't really think anything of it. And eventually, it was a little slow getting off the road. Eventually, it wandered into the woods. So I said, "That's fine." Put the car in gear. I was actually driving my dad's car. Put the car in gear and started to pull forward to go. And uh, when I got up near where the moose was, here it popped out on the road again. This time, right in front of me, and just stood sideways in the road. So I stopped, and I was still several hundred feet from it or a couple hundred feet from it, but uh, but it was much, much closer. And it, it stood there and wouldn't move. And so I actually pulled over to the shoulder and put the car in neutral and put the emergency brake on and just sat quietly. And uh, But I still had my headlights on. And I sat there for probably five minutes, which is a long time to wait for a moose. And it just stood there, didn't make any move. I didn't honk or make any you know, effort to get it to move. And then all of a sudden it turned and started walking very meandering toward me. And it, it was, I was on the right side, you know, and it was way over on the left side and it's a pretty wide gravel road. And I thought, well, that's odd. But of course, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about Bruce's story, but the, the one that had chased him was a big bull and uh, far away, you know, too far to have gone there in one day. So I, um, I thought, well, it's just going to walk past me and then I can go and doesn't want to go in the woods for some reason. So it did, it kind of meandered slowly. It would stop and then meander and it came down and it was well off away from me. And when it came out of the headlights, when its head came out of the glare of the headlights, it looked over at the car and I was looking at it, you know, by this time it's only about 20 feet away. And it just turned and took like three galloping, galloping bounds and reared up and came crashing down with its hooves on the windshield right in front of me. And as it, I, much too quickly for me to do anything, to react, to put the car in gear, try to do anything. And as I saw the hooves coming down, I did two things. I, I covered my head with my hands and kind of leaned over in the seat, thinking that it might come through the windshield. And at the same time, I was thinking, oh, this is going to scratch my dad's car. <laughs> and, and then it caved in the windshield and I thought, whoa, it did way more than scratch it. <laughs> and it actually, luckily the safety glass held, but it bashed the windshield right down on the dash. And then it kind of rolled off and it smeared its nose across the driver's window and uh, back onto its feet and kind of looked at me and then just meandered down the road like nothing had ever happened. <laughs> and, and I was like, oh my gosh. So I waited until it was pretty, you know, it just kept on walking away down the road behind me. I waited a little while and got out and I actually had to, it had bent in the fender and caved in the windshield and I had to bend the fender out so it wasn't rubbing on the tire and and I had to drive home leaning over into the passenger seat so I could see out the the windshield. 
And uh, the funniest part of the whole story was when I called the insurance company to report it the next day. I called this woman and she said, uh, you know, what's the nature of your accident? And I said, well, a moose jumped on my car. There was this long pause and she said, you hit a moose with your car? And I said, nope, I was parked and the moose came and jumped on me <laughs> right on the windshield, really damaged the car pretty seriously. And she said, there's another long pause and she said, I can't wait for lunch today. This is going to be the best story of anybody at lunchtime. <laughs> so, uh, so that's a, that's a kind of a, I've never heard of it since. I was chased a couple of times after that, although I was where a moose would turn and run at me. I, that happened a, a few times after that. Uh, one time Cindy was behind me in another car. So I'm trying to back up, but she didn't really see it. So she's not backing up. So I'm on the two way radio saying back up, back up, back up. And uh, we did manage to escape that one and never got never got jumped on again. But very odd, you know, that just doesn't happen. And of course, now we don't have nearly as many moose in the area. So uh, it's unlikely to happen to anyone. So the, there's an animal story for you. But I've got so many hundreds of them. I could I could go all night. Maybe let's do a couple more questions and maybe end with an animal story. Sure. <laughs> uh, somebody asked, uh, tell us about the period of transition to the boundary waters from the original period of the forest. Oh yeah, that's something I definitely wanted to cover. Um, so the, the boundary waters canoe area wilderness is kind of the accidental wilderness because a lot of that land was private. Um, big swaths of it were held by timber companies and by mining companies even back in the day and privately by just individuals. Um, but the depression, uh, caused most of those people to uh, you know, go bankrupt and they didn't pay their taxes and it went tax forfeit. So it ended up going back to either the state or the federal government as tax forfeit land. And that opened up the opportunity. And then uh, President Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt uh, uh, created the Spear National Forest along with many other accomplishments in conservation as, as you all know. And then within that, uh, based on some recommendations of Forest Service employees, originally in the oh, World War I era, the Forest Service had a program, very serious program called A Road to Every Lake. And their plan was to build roads to every lake in the Boundary Waters, or a road to every lake in the Boundary Waters, and then sell the lakeshore property privately in order to create a huge economic boom. So we would have been what a little impractical because of the topography, but that was the plan at the time. And um, we would have been like Brainerd Lakes area is now like the whitefish chain is with just homes ringing every lake and a very different, uh, obviously very different than the wilderness. Uh, but when all the land went tax forfeit, it opened up the opportunity to do something in terms of preservation and some very, very intelligent and, and uh, wonderful people in the starting in, in the early 1920s and even a little bit before that uh, worked for hard for many years, fighting off many different interests to to uh, create what at first was called the roadless area, which was just kind of a internal Forest Service designation. Still allowed some logging and some road building, but uh, in spite of being called the roadless area, but it was uh, sort of preserved. And um, you know, the, it's a I, I don't want to go into that history in depth because books have been written on it. Uh, it's really interesting, um, and then. In 1964, the Wilderness Act was passed, and it was the major architect of the Wilderness Act was Senator Hubert Humphrey from Minnesota. And uh, of course, many other people worked on it, but he carried the bill. And uh, the Boundary Waters was included in that. Um, by the way, the name Boundary Waters Canoe Area, the story is that as they were starting to draft the bill, a uh, uh, legislative aide said, what's this wilderness in Minnesota called this road? We can't, we can't have it be called a roadless area. What's it, what's it known as? And somebody said, well, it's kind of the, like the canoe area of the boundary waters of you know, Canada. And so it'd kind of be the boundary waters canoe area. And the guy said, well, let's use that until we can think of a better name. <laughs> so that's how we ended up with that awkward name. I, I would love to change it to the Sigurd Olson wilderness, but that probably won't happen in my lifetime. But um, anyway, so that's, that was the brainchild of the, and it was included in the 1964 Wilderness Act, but already there was a lot of commercial activity within the wilderness, logging, resorts in the wilderness, cabins in the wilderness, there were airplanes were flying in, um, or had recently been banned from flying in, but had been a big thing. And so, and motor use, of course, which was banned under the Wilderness Act, 
So Humphrey, right at the last minute, got a lot of pushback uh, from local constituents in northeastern Minnesota uh, who wanted to leave it open to logging and mining and, and uh, more heavy development, thinking that was the better way to go economically. And Humphrey really wanted it to be a wilderness. So he put, if you read the Wilderness Act, it's a beautiful, very concise piece of language describing what wilderness is and how Congress designates wilderness. And then there's another 18 pages or something of specific exemptions for the Boundary Waters Canoe Area. And it included some motor use and some logging and some, you know, uh, uh, use of vehicles on some portages and uh, a bunch of exemptions. Um, and uh, so the uh, there's a letter that exists that Humphrey wrote to somebody, a friend at the time saying, they forced me to put in all these exemptions. I was able to get it in the bill, but I had to give up, concede all these exemptions, but I know they will be controversial. So eventually they'll come out and it'll be a pure wilderness. So Humphrey sort of based on that letter set us up for years of controversy, but it, ultimately his, his uh, prediction came true. And in a series of lawsuits and, and really tough fight that even goes on somewhat to this day, gradually, gradually more wilderness designation has been given to the Boundary Waters. And, and uh, in 1978, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, that's where the word wilderness got added officially, uh, act passed, and it made the Boundary Waters a pure wilderness like every other wilderness in the system, except for a couple of exceptions. So some lakes like Saginaga here and Seagull and Cook County and uh, Basswood and, and uh, Trout Lake over in St. Louis County allow motors. Um, there's still some uh, motorized portage activity over there, but it's um, mostly pure wilderness now. And actually most of the controversy has gone out of it. So, but my parents were involved in that and actually pushed hard for wilderness designation when it was very unpopular locally. There was actually a demonstration in Grand Marais in the 1976, I think, where the uh, crowd of people marched through downtown Grand Marais and occupied the Forest Service station, <laughs> threw, the, threw the ranger out of his office. It was, it was uh, pretty hot and heavy times and a lot of hard feelings. Still occasionally hear that from old timers, but mostly now people accept the wilderness as a good idea. And uh, I think eventually it'll become pure wilderness. Um, you know, really pure wilderness, even the small exemptions that exist now will, will go away. My dad testified in Ely in favor of the, eventually it became a struggle between the pure wilderness people and the, and the compromise people. And uh, he testified in favor of pure wilderness in Ely at a very contentious hearing in 1977, I would guess. And by then I was sort of managing at least the outfitting side of the business. I was in my mid twenties by then. And I, I, um, he came home from the hearing and I said to him, uh, he got out of the car, I remember, and I said, uh, the same car the moose jumped on actually. He got out of the car and I said, how did it go? And he said, fine, fine. But I could see on his face, he wasn't easily shaken and he looked a little bit, he had a funny look on his face. And I said, really, you know, what was it like? And he said, well, first time I've ever been spit on. <laughs> so, and he said, uh, six men followed him to his car and said, we know where your children go to school and you better have your fire insurance paid up. <laughs> and being the level-headed psychologist that he was, I said, oh, that sounds bad. You know, maybe we should tell the police or something. And he said, no, they're all talk. That will never happen. And he was right, of course, but that's how hot and heavy it was. And then in my turn, when I got in running the business, I got involved in 1970 or 1996, there was an effort to introduce legislation that would have made the Boundary Waters a county park and uh, really was sort of a backdoor, uh, was the kind of during the, you know, the uh, anti-federal revolution in Congress and kind of a backdoor way of getting rid of the wilderness. And I got deeply involved in that and testified before Congress three times. Paul Wellstone said, uh, they're gonna put it on your gravestone, Bill. <laughs> you testified three times. Um, and uh, Eventually, you know, my parents were always politically active, active in the community. I followed in their path and, and uh, pro wilderness work was one of my areas where I put a lot of my effort. I also put a lot of effort into pro into economic development, which people know less about that I actually probably put more effort into that. <laughs> and I see wilderness definitely as an economic driver in this area. And I think that's 
pretty well accepted now that it's, it's done well. But we're back into it again now with the sulfide mining. I won't go into that in, in depth again. There are a lot of places that you can find out about that. But the struggle goes on to protect the wilderness and probably will go on um, for the next few generations. Well, Bill, we're getting close to the time, but I'm seeing there's still some great questions. I'm going to invite people to be joining um, with video so you can maybe see some of your old um, previous, uh, crew members. But if you want to answer any of the other questions that are on there, you can look through. There's some great questions. I keep thinking we might need another session of this. Well, so I'd be happy to any time. As I, as I said, <laughs> I'm, a, <laughs> I'm often uh, accused of telling too many stories, so I'm not sure what people's uh, capacity is for it. But uh, um, I'm not really seeing too many questions in the comments here. Oh, nope, they're in the Q&A section, and I can read some oh. of them too. Um, yeah. We have somebody asking about the blowdown. We also have some questions about Roy and Phoebe stories, <laughs> about crew we members. an hour and a half on the dogs of Sawbill, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, crew members, uh, how many you usually have, how do you recruit them? And then also about if you in, um, include food with what you do. And then we also yeah. have a question mm -hmm. about who your favorite um, old crew members are. So <laughs> I'm going to invite them all in uh, for They're video. all my favorites, every single <laughs> one. <laughs> That's like asking, so, who, who's your favorite child? <laughs> That's so what I, I, when people ask me, what's your favorite lake in the Boundary Waters? I used to get that question a lot. And my pat answer was, that's like asking, who's your favorite child? So I'll use the same pat answer for who's your favorite former crew member. They really are all my favorites. You know, as I said before, it's basically a large family. Oh, I did want to mention very quickly how many people have settled from former crew members have settled in Grand Marais. And if you'll indulge me, I'm going to read the list really quickly for the Grand Marais people will will know a lot of these people. I want to first of all point out that the executive director of Cook County Higher Education, the sponsoring organization for this talk, uh, is Karen Blackburn, a former Sawbill crew member and the, uh, the uh, president of our local clinic or the director of our local clinic, um, which is a wonderful clinic, is Kate Serbaugh, former Sawbill crew member. Um, Steve Serbaugh, uh, Carol Winter has just moved to Grand Marais, a former crew member. Nancy Sealar, many of you would know, longtime Cook County resident, former crew member. Uh, KB O'Neill, her sister, um, longtime crew member. John Oberholzer, Andy Keith, Anna Cook, uh, works at Lutzen Resort. Jessica Hammer, I already mentioned, still works at Sawbill. Lori Senti, I mentioned. Natasha White, Barb Osborne, who lived many years in Hovland, lives in Grand Marais now. Eric Frost and Jessa Frost, who live in Tofty. Jessa's a program director at North House. Dave and Amy Freeman, who are both uh, world renowned explorers and uh, um, spent a year in the Boundary Waters a few years ago, former Sawbill crew members. Corey Belt, Joyce Cleese, Jell Anderson, Meredith Clausen. And then, of course, my brother Carl, his wife, Lee Stewart, Dan and Claire, I've already mentioned, the current owners, Cindy and I, my sister, Rana, and then, of course, my parents, who are no longer with us, but um, live, lived out their lives in Grand Marais. So I just wanted to, it's 30 people that have stuck in the county, and then there are many more that are either have, I see Sandy Zinn, who has a summer place here, or a, not a summer place, but a cabin here, and, and Will, I see in the background, her husband, both Sawbill crew members, and then... Uh, Duluth, of course, many in Duluth, Minneapolis, and as far away as Hollywood, California. Bruce uh, Rubenstein, I see here, we call Rube, who, who worked there, uh, I don't know how many years ago. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, so I did want to mention that. Um, sorry, what were the other questions? There was Who's questions yes, about the blowdown. Oh yeah, the blowdown actually pretty much skipped Sawbill, uh, at least immediately at Sawbill. We lost like 12 trees on our property or 10 trees, uh, only a couple of big ones. And we thought it was terrible until we saw what happened elsewhere. And then we felt really, really lucky. So only one of our commonly used canoe routes was hit hard. And uh, I give a lot of credit to the Forest Service who came in with fire crews and uh, basically cleared it out in a week to 10 days and put us back in business for the summer. Um, uh, so yeah, we were spared. We've, we've been knock on wood, spared major forest fires. The last big fire that went through Sawbill was in 1895 or, there, or thereabouts. And um, we've had some close calls, the Pagami Creek fire, uh, which is the biggest fire in modern history in the Boundary Waters was bearing down on us. It, it moved 15 miles in two hours directly towards Sawbill. 
and um, was within an hour of engulfing us when the wind changed and it went in a different direction. So we got very lucky there. Um, yeah, so what else? We also had a question about, do you provide food with the canoe and the tent and everything? Yeah, yeah, uh, food, food is part of it for sure, complete outfitting. We do, as I always told people, you can rent one spoon from Sawbill or you can get everything you need, just come with your clothing and we do the rest and everything in between. So completely flexible that way. Is there a fan favorite meal? Well, I think it's changed now. Uh, uh, let's see. Gosh, maybe somebody can help me out here. It was uh, chicken beef and stroganoff. <laughs> beef stroganoff, yeah, back in the day was big and uh, chicken and dumplings. Um, I'm not sure what the current is right now. I've been, I've been gone for a couple of years. So yeah, there's always a favorite. Uh, and a lot better, I'll say that. The food has gotten much better over the years. Uh, uh, can you tell me how many crew, crew members you usually have per summer? Well, it started out with one. Actually, our crew member, almost number one, I think she might have been there the second year, just passed away, unfortunately. Uh, uh, Dee Hedman, Dee Sampson was her name, just passed away in Duluth. But uh, uh, so we started out with having one or maybe two. Uh, we shared some employees with the lodge <laughs> initially, but now it's up to about uh, 13, 14, right around in there every year. Uh, and then Jessica stays the year round. It, we used to hire almost exclusively college students and they'd stay with us for three, four or five years, depending on their college career. But now we've, they, uh, there are a fair number of uh, retired or older people that worked and some people that kind of make a, almost a career out of working at Sawbill and then working somewhere else in the winter. So it's changed a little bit, still plenty of college kids too, but uh, mostly we hire from out of the area and because they, they, have to live with us. So local kids really aren't that interested in moving 20 miles and living with other people, you know, if they, they would want to try to commute and it's just too far. So we've never had much luck recruiting local kids, but uh, people come from all over the country. And then I, still the Roy and Roy and Phoebe story. Yeah. <laughs> well, those are two of, two of the many illustrious. Roy is still with us. He lives with us in retirement in Grand Marais almost 13 and he's a little deaf and is losing a few teeth, but otherwise hasn't, hasn't dropped a step, still uh, terrorizing uh, everything in the woods. Um, but yeah, too many, too many stories there to go into in the minute we have left. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I just wanted to give you guys some time at the end. Um, if anybody wants to ask any questions, this is your time. You can unmute yourself and ask away. Or just say hi. <laughs> <laughs> I see a lot of Friendly faces here. <laughs> well, I'll give you a couple more minutes to just hang out, but thank you guys all for coming today. And uh, if you have some questions we didn't get to, maybe there is another session in this uh, for Bill or other uh, people as well. Uh, please let us know if there's any other topics we could ever cover for the future. And I will be sending out an email tomorrow that includes um, a little survey asking for some feedback. Um, but maybe my maybe my brother can do the next one. He can set you straight on all the things that I got wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this brother. Be a family event. <laughs> yeah. Or your sister. <laughs> yeah, or my sister. <laughs> yeah, I can add a few things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there she is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard was, to food was a big specialty of our mother because she would give people a menu choice and you could pick and then she'd She'd package it in a meal so you'd have Monday breakfast, you know, Monday dinner, Tuesday breakfast, and then lunch was all together in one big bag. So that, that was a big feature, trying to figure out exactly how many slices of bread you needed to take for how many people so you weren't carrying extra weight. So that was, I think that was important for people. That actually brings up a, a, a quickly say that my parents were uniquely suited to uh, running a business together and that my mother was the business person and could figure out that those kind of complex algorithms. She did the books, she did the accounting, she was back office, um, also very good at working with customers, but my dad was much more the front front of the house, you know, sort of the, uh, he, he would, uh, when people would ask him, what's the weather going to be like while I'm out there, he would always say, oh, it's going to be fabulous. Because <laughs> he said, you can't change it, so why not just give people good news? You know, <laughs> but um, he really was very, very skilled at working with people, and so they were a good team. But 
I think it may, no offense to Dan, I hope he's not listening, but uh, Sawville's always been a case of that you could talk to the man in charge or the woman who actually knows what's going on. <laughs> Any questions from the group? We're seeing some photos. We still have 46 people on this beyond the photos you're seeing. So maybe people didn't get a chance to ask a question. Okay, come on. Now, Bill, uh, you got to tell a story about Phoebe doing, uh, had, a, had a critter uh, underneath the, the deck one time. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was, uh, I was just thinking about that last night, actually. Uh, Phoebe, we've had, of course, many great animal encounters, but Phoebe was a little terrier, a little, kind of a mix of terriers, but a small dog, like 25 pounds. And, and uh, but she had, a, she just died recently, but she was extremely fierce dog um, and very self-possessed. And one day she was under our deck at our, of our house, barking and just barking and barking and barking and wouldn't stop and wouldn't come out. And I looked under there a few times and clearly she had something cornered but I couldn't tell what, but she wouldn't listen to me when I tried to call her out. So after about five hours of continuous barking, I finally crawled under there to see what she had. And here she had a bobcat backed up in, in the rafters and she was standing not less than a foot from this bobcat, nose to nose with this bobcat, just barking in its face. And, and the bobcat looked at me like, get this goddamn dog out of my face. And, and uh, I saw the bobcat I, when, I, when I sort of inserted myself, the bobcat freaked out a little bit and actually went after her, you know, kind of swiped at her. And she just dodged it and went right back in and continued to bark at it. So I uh, had to give her credit there. She was not, the bobcat was every bit her size and, you know, bobcats are, are, can be tough. So she was not intimidated. So finally, I crawled under there far enough to um, to get her out. She she finally came when she saw I was coming to physically get her out, put her in the house, and then we had a live trap that was an appropriate size, and we set it out with some uh, uh, out of date Thuringer in it, and caught the bobcat within five minutes. It went right in after the meat. I think the poor thing was starving, which is probably why it was under the deck in the first place. And we took it down the road and there's a YouTube video. If you, if you look up Bobcat Sawbill on YouTube, I'm sure it's still there, of Cindy and I releasing the, uh, releasing the Bobcat. And when we opened, we took it, you know, 10 miles down the road and released it and put some meat out for it. And uh, which I actually kind of got in trouble for. The state doesn't like you moving their Bobcats around without permission. But under the circumstances, I thought it was the best thing to do. And um, they, uh, I didn't really get in trouble, but I got a little rebuke. But uh, when we opened the cage, the darn thing wouldn't come out. And uh, so it was, it was, you know, Cindy's and I are talking as we're doing it and Cindy was nervous and she was talking fluent Minnesotan. Well, it turned out that we put it on YouTube thinking our customers would enjoy it. And it went viral <laughs> because of Cindy's accent. Some blog in the, some YouTube channel in the Twin Cities put it up as their most, uh, their the deepest Minnesota accent of the week. <laughs> and it, it got thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of hits after that. Not so much in the, uh, the idea of releasing a bobcat, but from Cindy's accent. So <laughs> we got a kick out of that. So you, you can find that on YouTube. And when you look, if you look under Sawbill links, you'll find, uh, I also filmed some links uh, kind of confronting each other on the road, an amazing uh, Link's behavior video that I got a few years back, and uh, that's on there too. If you look up Sawbill Links, since then, at the time, nobody had ever filmed anything like that. Now there are a few of them up there, but uh, so yeah, lots of animal stories, no shortage. Does Sawbill have a YouTube channel? Should I be subscribing to it? You know, it it does, it, although it's pretty inactive, I think. But there are a few things there, and if, of course, if you YouTube search on YouTube Sawbill you get a lot of other people's stuff too. And there's, you know, there's some pretty good stuff on there. They also blog. You can, you can follow along for stories. On well, that's the other thing I meant to mention is Sawbill has a blog. Um, it started so early. We, we computerized very early at Sawbill. We bought our first computer in 1980. It was an Apple II Plus and we still have it. It's actually worth something as a collector's item right now. It's worth about a thousand dollars, I'm told. And it still works, but um, uh, we right away used it for the business and have continued to be 
heavily invested in technology for the business since then. And um, in 1997, we started what we called the newsletter online because the blog hadn't been invented yet. But uh, now it's officially a blog and they still keep it up. So you can read, you can go back and read the news of Sawbill um, from yesterday all the way back to 1997. It's funny, I just said to Claire yesterday, I said, I'm so bored, Claire. You guys aren't posting on Facebook or Instagram. She said, well, we've been so busy that they just haven't had time for social media. So they had 13 complete outfitting trips this week. Yeah. So. It's been, it's been uh, the pandemic has affected them in an odd way. They opened late, not until June. So they missed Memorial Day, which is a big time. But since they've been open, they've been absolutely running at capacity. And that's true of all the outfitters. Um, and many of the, almost anything that's wilderness related or outdoor related is just going gangbusters right now. So it's been very odd for them. And they've, they've had, uh, they had to make quite a serious adaptations because of all living there for the pandemic, uh, but they did it. Um, so grateful, Dan and Claire. Dan's a chemist by training, so he has a lot of experience in lab procedures and being careful and having checklists and knowing how to deal with stuff. And, uh, and Claire trained as a lawyer. So between them, their skills were ideally suited and uh, they, uh, they really have come up with a great plan, but they are busy, busy, busy. It's true. I feel like I heard that they were operating in like kind of pods, like family pods, that they were rotating like who did what based on that. So that would, if, to keep people healthy, that we're all together. Well, they're, they're basically one pod because they all live together, <laughs> together. So that's the issue. If one of them gets sick, they're all out. So it's, um, um, it's, a, it's a harder for them than other type businesses. So they've been more strict um, with the customers and with the crew trying to keep everybody protected. And they're doing a great job. And knock on wood, so far so good. They did not anticipate they would be this busy though. That came out of the blue. So they're, they're running hard and uh, fortunately it's not too long of a season. So hopefully they'll survive. And who knows by August, September, we all might be shut down again. It doesn't, you know, it's hard to know, so. Well, thank you, Bill, very much for putting this on tonight and being willing to share your stories and history. Um, it, I know that there's so much more we haven't even heard yet. So thank you guys for all coming. We'll give you a couple more minutes together, um, but otherwise I'll be ending. Yeah. So Bill can go on with his night. Yeah, I'll <laughs> stay. I'm, I'm happy to stay all night, I, you know, but <laughs> I want to be respectful of people's time. So uh, uh, the uh, people can feel free to drop off and the, the the crew members and family can can schmooze <laughs> or stay if you want. I think you did a great job. You did a great job, and I even learned a few things I didn't know. So uh. <laughs> good, good. So, Bill, what are you doing until you get called back to Uganda? Well, it's kind of fun. I'm um, I've always been very busy person, <laughs> running a business and always been very involved in, in local things and volunteering, you know, in many, many capacities, uh, which I learned from my parents and my children are, uh, are also doing. Uh, Dan and Claire are both deeply involved in the community. Dan's the chair of the local school board, uh, uh, Independent School District 166, and uh, Claire is the recent new chair of the clinic, uh, uh, Sawtooth Mountain Clinic, which is a federally qualified clinic here. So it's a, the chair plays a big role and it's a complicated job. Actually, my dad did it for 22 years or 23 years and was the chair. So it's really fun to see his granddaughter uh, stepping into his shoes to run this wonderful clinic. But for me, since I got back from Uganda, I've been pretty free to do what I want in, within the realm, within the confines of being quarantined. So I've been doing a lot of fishing and boating and um, canoeing and hiking, running. Uh, basically every day I just get to get up and I still have to, you know, mow the lawn, do the dishes and that kind of thing. But uh, in terms of, uh, you know, any kind of professional obligation, I'm pretty free. And even when people have called me to say, oh, would you come sit on this board or some of the boards I was on want me back and I'm able to fend them off right now for, for a legitimate reason is that I might be gone in six months. So it's probably not good for me to get deeply involved in an organization. I'm helping, um, I'm working on politics as I always have. Um, no secret, I'm a Democrat. And uh, so I'm working on democratic policies, uh, politics and uh, you know, in an informal capacity. 
and I'm working with many of the projects that I worked on before, but more behind the scenes, you know, doing fundraising, um, just advising, you know, that kind of thing. And I actually still working with my organization in Uganda. Um, you know, they sell coffee as I, rec as I mentioned, and they sold their first coffee to the U S um, they're a relatively new cooperative. So they sold their first container of coffee in the U S which was a new market for them. And uh, that was back in December. And now they've sold three more containers, two, three to the US, two more to the US and one to Austria. So when they sell coffee in the US, they often ask me to uh, get involved with the buyer. They'll, they'll, the buyer will make an inquiry and then they're usually brokers or large roasters. And then they'll, uh, they'll make an inquiry. And then my organization in Uganda will say, great, we'd love to do business with you. Why don't you call Bill and talk to him about it? Because he worked for us and he knows who we are, knows us intimately, and he can vouch for us. He was a Peace Corps volunteer, so he has no money in the business, you know, and, and it gives me a lot of credibility. So I, I've been able to do a lot of, make a lot of sales for him. And they are a great organization. So um, that's been kind of fun. So it's unpaid, but satisfying work. And the, the mothers, by the way, the mothers that we were supporting are, are doing much better. Um, they're making real money now and and uh, things are visibly improving in the community so it's really gratifying to see what's going on with the bands nothing because no musicians are working right now uh, you're not uh, doing any socially distant uh yeah no what? nothing uh, really there um a few people are playing on the street here or playing outdoor gigs but it's been pretty minimal so far that's uh, for us. the venues are struggling you know they're kind of losing money right now i think and so they're not they're not excited to hire bands. And so it's just, it's basically not happening. Rube's referring, I was kind of a hobbyist musician, although I ended up in the last 10 years or so, 15, well, maybe 20 years, uh, being basically a professional musician in Cook County because there's so much opportunity, uh, part-time job, but uh, one that I found really satisfying. But uh, no, nothing, nothing in the way of professional music right now. And that's the musicians have been hit really hard by the pandemic. They're really, they're mm -hmm. taking it almost the worst of any profession. Obviously very bad out here in Los Angeles too. Yeah. Musicians. Yeah. And, and all entertainment people really get hit hard by this. Fortunately, canoe outfitters <laughs> so far have come out of it pretty well, but, uh, but the unfair part of the pandemic, uh, one, one thing, I'll, the little story I'll tell is that uh, Mike Osterholm, who's the epidemiologist that you see every, every day in the New York Times and on PBS and all the networks, and you know, he's ubiquitous. He's the director of the uh, Infectious and Tropical Disease Center at the University of Minnesota, is a former Sawbill customer. <laughs> so I knew him back in the day. He hasn't come for many years. And uh, I think he, I don't know if he still canoes. He used to go to the Quetico a lot, but he went on canoe trips every year. And back in the 1980s, early 80s, we cooperated with him. He did a study on Giardia in the Boundary Waters. And um, most, he tried to get the outfitters to hand out questionnaires to their customers. And they all turned him down flat um, because they said, well, I don't want to give a questionnaire about a disease you can catch while you're on your vacation, you know, to my <laughs> customers. Are you crazy? But um, my dad and, and I both agreed that, um, and, and my mom agreed that at the time that, uh, uh, we wanted to know if there was a problem with Giardia. So most of the studies that were done, most of the interviews that were done, were done with Sawbill customers, about 80% of them. And so I ended up working with Mike pretty closely at the time. And uh, turns out, if you look up that study, that Giardia is really no more prevalent in the Boundary Waters than it is anywhere else. There is a risk of catching it in the Boundary Waters, but the risk is no greater than it is anywhere else. Uh, and even less if you're careful about how you collect your water or treat your water. So uh, that that part of the study was sort of disappointing for him, I think, as an epidemiologist. But uh, but I got to know him, so it's fun to see him. And he's, boy, I'll tell you, when it comes to pandemic advice, he's the one I listen to because he knows it more than anyone. So it's fun to have that personal connection. <laughs> Anybody else? Sure fun to see all your faces. There's a handful of people that are not on video right now. If you are wanting to communicate and you don't want to um, talk, you're welcome to put it in the Q&A or in the chat function. Yeah. Um, we just 
like two weeks ago, Bill told Anders that mood story. Oh yeah. <laughs> he excited he was here when you were telling it. I don't know where he is now, but he was excited to hear it straight from you. So. Uh, <laughs> Anders is their son. These are um, we've had a number of marriages from people working at Sawbill, and this couple, um, Sandy's in, and and uh, Will here are uh, are. Uh, a prime example, Net, networking at Sawbill and Will Decker and are uh, happily married, at least up until today. It's <laughs> 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 all you can say. <laughs> Actually, Sandy has Cook County roots. Her grandfather was a dentist in town here. And uh, Will's father was a very early customer at Sawbill, bringing groups up from the University of Iowa. So he had long history for both of them with Sabo. Hey Bill, was Rube the guy that was in Antarctica for a while? I guess I could ask Rube that. No, but that was not me. Oh, was that? Who, was, who was that? <laughs> who was who was your friend that was in Antarctica? Well, I had a childhood friend that was there way back in the in 1981. <laughs> that you may remember, but uh, Corey Belt was the crew member that he was in Antarctica last year. <laughs> He's been wow. down there many times. He lives in the county here. I gotcha. think, so you're thinking of one of those two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, Bill, I'm gonna hang up because I haven't gone into the house since I got home from work. So good to see you. Good to see you guys. Now I'm gonna go to eat dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's go. Bye, huh? <laughs> well, thanks everybody. Thanks, Kelsey, for having me. This was really fun. This was great. Thanks, thanks for doing it. More, yeah. more crew hangout. That's what thanks, we did. Yeah. yeah. Good job. Yeah. Crew hangout. Technology. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of fun. Yeah. Great fun. Maybe we should organize a Sawbill Crew Zoom reunion. Yeah. That'd be a good <laughs> idea. Get on that, Kathy. <laughs> yeah, get on that. We had to cancel ours, so we're gonna do that. Yeah. Yeah, the in-person reunions aren't happening this year. Yeah. Sadly. All right. Well, good night, everybody. The Minnesota long goodbye. Goodbye. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Bye. Bill, I'm gonna send you an email. I just um, somebody had a question about the name of the um, study that you were following that created the credit the credit system. Um, oh, well, it was from a book. From an, it's actually a novel. Uh, it's called Walden, Walden Two. Like uh, the two is like a Roman numeral two. I think and, they said uh, a study that they were talking about. So maybe it was something else. Then I'll have to look really quick. Oh, okay. Um, well, I mean, it was based on psychological research. Uh, B. F. Skinner was the psychologist. Um, the but my dad actually met him. The Harvard write-up on the managerial methods. Oh, that, I don't know, Tom referred to that. I'm not familiar. There are a few who have, actually WTIP, <clears throat> our local radio station, did a nice, uh, uh, Ann Passas, the producer there, did a nice uh, story on work credit. That's probably the most accurate description of it if you want to look there. So WTIP.org, and then <clears throat> you can just search on their site for, uh, you know, Sawbill, work credit and it'll pop up. I just awesome. And that's Walton or Walden with a D? Walden, W-A-L-D-E-N. Okay. It was a famous Thank novel you. in its day. It's kind of fallen out of favor now, I think, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was great. I can't even, there's so many nice comments in the Zoom web in our chat right now. So hopefully you take a quick second to read, but uh, people loved it. Uh, my pleasure, my pleasure. Well, have a great night, everybody. Enjoy the, the dwindling sun as we get into this later evening. Right. Thanks, Kelsey. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.